is this webinar important? And I appreciate that you all have um, given me your synchronous meeting time this week so that we could go over this. Uh, we could have met by email or on the discussion board one-on-one, -on -one, but sometimes it's just much more inviting and nicer to connect like, like this as if um, we were in a face-to-face -face classroom. So writing a dissertation is a daunting task. I'm sure you all are at that point. Finding the literature can be frustrating. There's so much out there. What do you pick? What's the best? How do you use that to start building your conceptual framework and your argument? And then organizing all of that can just be overwhelming. And yet you still have to read it all and write about it. So my goal tonight is to help you come up with some strategies for preparing and working through those initial steps of the literature search because that prep time that you put into it actually will help you as you go through, give you peace of mind, and just make it go a little more smoothly. Research is never easy, even for me and uh, you know, I have a degree in how to use all of this. I've got undergraduate degrees in literature and in history where I spent my life reading, writing, researching. It's frustrating for me at times. I still do a lot of just playing around with my search terms, with the databases, with Google Scholar, until I really start to get where I need to go. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that tonight, and we're going to use the topic that I'm currently working on with um, in one of my classes, and that's the idea of authorship in the field of technical communication. So basically I'm looking at uh, whether or not technical writers, so business writers, should be considered authors, or if it's really more of a an not quite anonymous, but author-free kind of um, uh, business writing. So the first step in the whole literature search process, the whole process of writing your literature review, excuse me, my headset is sliding down here, is this getting started step. Before you even touch the computer, it's really about some initial thinking, you might do some free writing, and a lot of brainstorming. And this brainstorming comes in the list of all the other questions that play into your larger question. Any concerns that you know already about the issue you're looking at, concepts that might be related, looking at who the stakeholders are that are interested in this topic. And that's not just the people that the research benefits or doesn't benefit, but who are those groups of researchers? And most um, topics are looked at by researchers from a variety of different disciplines. So looking at the, the concurrent disciplines, who all is researching this topic? And maybe you already know some key writings, some key theorists, theories, or authors that really relate to your topic. So as I've been working with my topic uh, this term for my uh, very long term paper, the questions that, have, that I've been pondering are what does authorship mean within the field of technical communication? What theories about writing or about communication are important in relationship to that question? Who has the power to decide which writers get to be authors? I mean, there's always a writer, but that idea of an, being an author versus just being a writer, who decides which writers get to take that label? And then how, do, within my paper, do I want to define authorship within technical communication? So some of my related concepts is the idea of a corporate author or collaborative authoring, collaborative writing, ghost writers. There's a whole piece of ethics related to authorship. And then there's the idea of power relations and writing 
And for me, this topic came about because of one of the key pieces of literature out there on it that I actually had to read for class. And it's a 1993 article by Slack, Miller, and Doak called The Technical Communicator as Author. And so I know that is an important piece on the topic that I will be using in my research, but it also helps me as a way to start getting to other articles and writings on my topic. So then the next thing, and this is a step that people frequently skip, and while it takes a little time to do up front, it actually saves you time in the long run. And this is to sit down and actually create a list of potential terms that you could use for searching. And these terms are going to come from your questions, they're going to come from those concepts that you have already thought about that relate to your topic, but you want to think broadly, tangentially. You want as many options as you can as you get started searching because if you get to a dead end with your first round, if you just pull from your main question and if all I do is authorship and technical communication, well, I might get stuck. I might not have enough resources. So I need to have an idea of where I'm gonna go next. And instead of getting to that stuck point and then going, okay, what, what else am I going to look under now? Having this list makes it easy to shift over and go a slightly different direction to get at the same concept, same ideas. And one thing I really wanna stress is that there is not a topic out there that has not been researched and written about from some angle. It may not be as specific as you are looking at, but the broader overarching concept has probably been researched by multiple people. And so the literature is out there. The key is figuring out what the right words are to get to it in the databases that have that literature. So sometimes you need to think creatively to get there. So for me, I've got this list of terms. I know I'm looking at authorship. Maybe I'll just shorten that a little bit and just look at authors um, as I'm searching. Technical communication, technical writing is a slightly narrower focus of technical communication. There's that concept of ghost writing, but that's not quite exactly where I'm going because that's a very specific, intentionally anonymous writer or somebody who their name's not mentioned, another person takes their name or puts their name on this, the ghostwriter's work. There's the ethics of it, the idea of corporate authors, of collaborative writing. So some of these aren't exactly where my topic is going, but pulling that literature might have really important ideas and points that I'm gonna wanna consider in my discussion of it. So then I also started thinking about who is going to be writing about this idea. So which databases am I going to need to get into? One of the major fields that's looking at technical communication is, of course, English. So I want to look at the databases that are out there for English and literature. JSTOR is one that does a great job with all sorts of humanities. MLA Bibliography is another one that I would use for my topic, but also business because that's where a lot of this writing is happening. So some of this is actually being discussed and published in the business writing. And part of doing your search terms is also thinking about all the different ways that the people in those fields would name it. So instead of technical writing, I might actually want to use the term business writing when I'm in the business databases. Or I might need to find specific instances, specific types of business writing that they might be talking about. So once I have this big list, where are we gonna go next? And this is a smaller list than maybe I would do for myself. I'd keep it in a journal, uh, but I didn't want to fill up the screen so much that it was not usable. So now we're going to move on to this initial search. I've got my, I've done my brainstorming. I may have done a little writing about it already, what I already know about the topic. 
And now I'm going to move into this first part of searching. And this is the place that I see a lot of students stop. They do this initial search and then they think they're done. They found everything, they used one search, and they think that they're good to go. But this really is just to skim the surface, to see what's immediately available, and to get a better feel for how the practitioners and scholars are actually studying the topic. You want to see what's out there and get a better understanding of what the literatures on your topic are. And then you're going to go a little deeper in the next round. So for this, it's really always best at this level to start in the library's databases. And that's because so much of the really high literature is not available for free. Google Scholar's great because it can point you to what might be out there, but a lot of what it points to is coming through um, subscription services, such as the actual journal publishers, Taylor and Francis, I'm sure you've run across, um, Sage journals, and we subscribe to those, but Google Scholar doesn't necessarily let you get directly into it. It's just providing you links to where those things reside, and if you don't go through the library where your fees are helping to pay for the subscriptions to those journals, you won't get access to them. So here's four different places that I suggest you start. If you're really focusing your dissertation topic on an education-related topic, then you can go straight to the Search at CU Libraries Education Edition. The Search at CU Libraries is new within the last, well, what is it, about a year and a half, year, year and a half. And what it is is a Google-like search that goes across all of the databases we subscribe to. So from one, starting point. You can search, it searches across all of those databases and comes back with a list. In the education edition, we've weeded out some of the things that aren't going to be useful because many of the times if you're searching the general edition of it, you can get over a million results back for a very broad search, way more than any of us really want to sort through. The, if you're not doing an education specific topic, such as what I'm demonstrating with, then we probably want to start in the general edition because you can then focus down to the fields you want, but you have a little bit broader place to go. And you can also go directly into the, the library resources guide that is linked from your courses. And using the find articles tab or the find books tab, you can you can specifically look for articles in a single database. If you just want to search ERIC to begin with, you can get to it there. You just want to search the ProQuest education journals. You can find the link there. Some people prefer that. The one issue we're having currently is that with the new um, single sign-in that the campus has gone to, some of the links from the single databases back to the search at CU are being a little wonky. So if you run into a problem, you can email me and I can help you troubleshoot that. That's why I'm suggesting you start in the bigger um, single search right now. And then there's always Google Scholar, but I suggest you leave that until later on. So let's take a look at the search at CU Libraries, the general edition. And I'm going to play around a little bit here with my topic. So first of all, if you haven't used this, the initial screen gives you this diagram of what it is that you search when you're using this. And when we're searching the second tab, books, articles, and more, we're actually searching all of our scholarly resources, our library catalog, the Summit Library catalog, which at least can give us an idea of other books that are available, and then our collections of articles out of the databases. So it's a really big, powerful search. 
So for my topic, and I was playing around earlier, I'm going to start with authorship and technical writing. And one thing I'd like you to notice, and if you don't do this when you're searching Google or one of the other internet search um, search engines, is putting a phrase inside quotation marks, because what that does is it says, I want you to look for those words together. Um, it can be very useful, can really help narrow down the number of items you get. So we're just going to search here. So I found 430 items. And if you notice across the top, it gives us quick places to limit down. Probably where you're going to want to start is limiting to peer-reviewed journals. Um, you can limit to a few other things, but right now peer-reviewed journals are really a good place to get your hands into this. It will show us all the different types of articles that are out there. Some things we aren't going to have, and those are things that you can request through interlibrary loan, and I'm happy to help people with that individually. But if we do have it, the quickest way to get to the full text is using this Access Online link. And what it does is it opens and it shows you the different databases we get it from. And by clicking on the name of the database, for here for example, JSTOR, it's actually going to take me directly to the full text of that article. So it's a real nice, easy way to start getting there. If we go back, you can, from here, one of the things that's really nice is if you find an article that seems to really be working for your topic or one aspect of your topic, let me look through here and see what we can find. Mm. We'll just take a look at this, teaching technical writing to students. The details tab often will give you some extra information that can help you as you're looking and searching. So in this case, it's giving me a list of subject headings. I can get it to highlight just what I want. No, it's not going to. And I can use these to find other articles that are on the same topic. It's a really nice way to do it. I think in the 600 series, you had an assignment where you were looking at the subject headings, and you can do that here as well. And clicking on this one, say authorship methods, it's going to redo the search for me and pull up just articles or other items that have the subject heading of authorship methods. So maybe useful for you to begin with, uh, to go along with later. Uh, it also, you can use those as a way to start adding more terms to your list. Um, I was, when I was searching earlier, that's where one of them had something about so technical writing methods might be interesting, had something about business writing, and that's what made me think, oh yeah, that's, that's another term that maybe I should use is business writing. Okay, so let me get back to here. The education edition will look just the same as the general one, but again, it's more focused on education. So as you do your initial searches, keep track of what is working for you and what's not working for you, especially if you go into the individual databases, because Sometimes one set of terms works better in one database than it does in another. And so if you keep a journal of that and just note, okay, when I searched in um, ProQuest, these terms brought up articles on my topic. But when I went into Eric's version or when I went to JSTOR, these were the words I needed. When you go back to do more searches, you'll then know which terms worked well in those databases, and it won't be the same matter of 
trial and error that you went through the first time. But don't get frustrated if the as you're doing these initial searches, you try something and you don't get anything. Just swap out some words to see if you get a better result. The other thing is if you've put in too many terms, start subtracting terms and gradually add back in other terms until you get to a good collection. Other things that I think are useful to keep track of, as you can see from my example, just things that you've discovered as you did your search. As I was searching um, this topic a while ago, what I discovered was a lot of the literature that actually specifically talked about authorship was older. And I'm older, I mean, you know, between 93 when that one article was written and the mid 2000s. Which makes me wonder why, have they changed how they're talking about it? Is it just that um, trends in research have changed right now? And so that's something I'd like to explore. I found that they talked about authorship in different kinds of ways. Sometimes it was the way that I think I want to look at it is somebody actually being the official author and what that means. And sometimes they looked at it more from the collaborative writing point of view or there's other um, ways that authorship is discussed within technical communication. Another thing that I found interesting was this was where was ghost writing is actually bigger in the last 10 years than the idea of authorship was, and a large part of that had to do with ethics in medical research and writing, because um, from what I could see, there were a bunch of uh, almost, not quite scandals, but there were some problems with the medical literature that seemed to relate to having ghost writers and whether uh, that's really very ethical. And then finally, if you start coming across repeated authors, make note of them, because then you can go and search for them. So one that I found was, um, a fellow named Jim Henry, who has done a lot of writing about um, authorship, teaching technical communication, teaching authorship within technical communication, all of that. One thing, though, that I want you to, to keep in mind is at this point, I'm not reading any of these things in depth. I'm simply scanning them. I'm scanning the abstracts. I'm scanning the subject headings to try and get a better idea of what I'm finding, where I should be going next, and what I want to keep and what I want to throw out. Because not everything is going to be useful. And then the things that we've discovered here from this initial search help us to actually refine the search and get to a better collection. So, the next step then, after we've done this initial search, we've figured out what terms are working, is to use those to go and expand what you're finding. You're using those new search terms. You're going to want to mine the references from the articles that you really like. And then you're going to want to find out that who is citing those articles that you really liked that you can then go and get and see if they are useful. So there are a couple ways of doing that that I want to show you first, and then we'll talk a little bit about organization because this is another thing that I feel students often leave too late, and then it becomes so overwhelming that if they have trouble moving forward. And if you work on your organizing and your citing at the beginning, it makes it a lot less frustrating and overwhelming to go. So if we go into Google Scholar, Google Scholar has a wonderful feature that allows you not only to see the articles and view the articles that a specific author has cited, you can also see who all has cited that author. So if we use the um, the article that um, I started my research from, which is the technical communicator as author. Google lets me see a number of different things right here. First of all, this cited by is telling me that there are 111 other articles 
or books that cite this specific article. Those might be things that I want to take a look at. By clicking on that, it gives me a list of all these different ones. So maybe the book Writing Workplace Cultures is something that I'll want to take a look at. Or, I don't know, this Triumph of Users. It's telling me that some of these are available here, but the best thing to do if you find one of these that you want is to go and search the title in that first place we were, that general search at CU Libraries. The other thing that is really nice about this is Google does pull some related articles. I cannot tell you how they do it. I really don't know what algorithm they're using. But I have been using Google Scholar for this function for a really long time. And I find that they actually do a pretty good job pulling other things that might fit with my topic based on that first article that I had entered. So again, you can go and find these based on um, the databases. So let's go see, I'm gonna, I know we don't do, have a whole lot of the journal technical communication quarterly, but let's see what we might have that I can search for. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. We might have this. So I'm just going to copy the title. I'm going to go back to this original search. Remember, this is where we were, search at CU. I'm going to clear this out, paste in this new title, and see if this is an article that we have. All right, we don't have it, but I can request it really easily. I, just by using the availability and requesting options, I can request it from interlibrary loan and get it. Let's see if there's another one that we might have. We might have computers and composition. Mm, of course not, because my topics are just not going to do it for us today. Okay. Anyways, so that's one of those things that Google Scholar is really nice for. And then you can also, if you have the article, take the title of one of the um, articles in its references, search it in our catalog the way I just tried searching those, and it will tell you if we have it. If we do, you can get it. But those are great ways to expand what um, articles you're looking at, what you have there. Um, Another, Maureen? Yes, go ahead. This is Marty. I, I just was searching on the side. We've, looks like we've got technical communication quarterly. Oh, okay. Well, let's yeah. pull one Give of them. Up. Sometimes we do get them and sometimes we don't. So let's try this one from 98. Uh -huh. Okay, there we go. So it's giving me the check for full text, the access online, and oh, we actually get it through ProQuest. So I could just click on one of these ProQuest links. It's going to all look the same once I get there. ProQuest Central is just a big overarching ProQuest collection. And then here's my article in the full text. 
for the PDF version. And so I can download it. Um, it's coming up here slowly. All right. And so it really can be an easy way to go about. So don't be afraid if you find we don't have something right away or you're not finding it. Um, just remember to go back to the search at CU Libraries. Try searching by the title and see where you get. Um, another um, piece, and I'm going to actually go back a, a, two slides here. In the EDD library resources, in the advanced search strategies, it gives you some suggestions of how to take a good article and find more articles related to that. So that's over on the left or right hand column, the who cited whom. That's what we were doing in Google Scholar was to see who else has used that article. But you can, as I said, take your um, the reference page and start looking for those articles. And this just gives you a little more information about it. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody saw that there were these other resources here in the ED library resources guide. And then actually while we're here, we can look a little bit at um, organization and citation management. I have listed um, here's some of the different citation managers that are out there and other organizers. So you can go through and take a look and see what each of them does and if there's something you'd like. Um, I will say that they aren't perfect at making citations, but what they are really good at is helping you keep things organized to see what you've already found because you're going to get to a point in your searching where you're going to start finding the same articles over again or you're going to start seeing trends in authors. And so if you've been keeping track of what you already have, it helps. Then you don't have two or three copies of the same article or if it's something you need to get through interlibrary loan, which um, I will go over in just a minute you won't have to re-request it because you'll already know that. And I'm not going to go through how to use the Tarot or Mendeley, any of those, because um, that's a whole hour long presentation for each of those by themselves. However, if we go back and we look at interlibrary loan here for a minute. Interlibrary loan means that for whatever reason, we don't subscribe to the journal that the article you want is coming from. But instead of you paying to get it, um, and I'm going to guess that people have come across the example. Let's see if we can get one here. You try and go to the site for the article. And here we go. It says, okay, you want it, you got to buy it. You never have to buy the articles. Part of the services that we offer you is that we will find a copy of the articles at a library that does own it, and we will get it for you for free. It can take a week, sometimes a little longer, if there aren't a whole lot of libraries that have access to it, and there are restrictions on um, sometimes which libraries can lend to us. But this is one of those things that we take very seriously is that as your library, we should be able to provide these things to you. And if we can't afford to buy them ourselves, we have partnerships with other libraries where we help each other's patrons out. So the link to requesting um, an item is always in this Access Online tab. 
And if it's something we have, it's way down at the bottom. If it's not something we have, so looking at this one here where it just says availability and requesting, if I click on this request from interlibrary loan, it takes me to the form that I need to fill out. And once I've filled this out, all of the information for the item is back here on this tab. Our interlibrary loan people will submit it and hopefully within a week you'll have a copy of it in PDF emailed to you. It's yours to keep, you're good to go. It's really a great service. And I'm always happy to help talk to you about how to go about it the first time. But our interlibrary loan folks are great. Maureen? Yes. Um, this is Marty. So we had a question from someone about books for ILL. Can, can you say something about that? Yeah. Books are a slightly different matter. We can get them for you, but because of the way it works, they have to come here to us physically and then we have to mail them out to you, which can make it take, you know, an extra week, two weeks, depending on where you're at. What actually is more efficient for you is if we figure out how you could get a hold of it near where you live. And I know that's not possible for everybody, um, but mm, I'd say 95% of the time I'm able to help students find either a public library or a university library near them that will let them at least go in and read the book there, even if you can't check it out. And so that's something that um, if you come across, I'm happy, happy to help you figure that one out. However, we do have a lot of books as ebooks. Because I searched specifically for this article, it's not going to show us a ton of these, I don't think. So let's just do a more general search here for, uh, we'll just do technical communication in general. And then we are going to see if we can find something here as an ebook. I'm going to go straight just to search. The search tab is just our library catalog. Okay, so here we go. We've got this one Technical Communication in the World Wide Web. It tells us here it's an ebook, and accessing it. It looks the same as when we're looking at journals. It's pretty similar. We have a few um, ebook collections that we get the majority of them through, and we actually have a lot of ebooks in our collection now. So EBSCO hosts ebook collection is one, and then there's a few others. When you go into it, yep, yeah, it's wanting me to go into Texas Techs. That's not where I want to go. Uh, let's find a different one here. It's still trying to make me go that way. Well, this is just crazy. All right, eBrary. You can, um, check out and download the books. So they check out for 14 days, you make an account for yourself. Um, you can also just read them online. And the nice thing about eBooks is that you can actually search through and see where the pieces you want are. So they're a great um, way to get access to that, those scholarly books. And that's what the majority of ours are, our scholarly books. Some of them allow you to do a little bit of um, printing, but not the whole thing. It'll be certain chunks. So for books, um, I'm happy to help you find them nearby you if we don't own it in electronic versions or if it's something that you really want to get in print and you're willing to wait the time or there's no copy near you, then um, that's something that um, I can help you 
figure out who to talk to here on campus about it. Um, the one thing is you're responsible for mailing them back to us. We pay postage to you. You pay the postage to mail it back to us. All right, let's see if we can finish up a little bit here. Okay, so organizing. The reason I really, really recommend that you start doing your organization at this point in time is because I have come across people, both doctoral candidates at when they have a completed dissertation as well as students of many other levels who, for whatever reason, didn't keep track of a source well enough and all they've got at that point is just an in-text author date citation. They don't know where the source came from. They don't have the page numbers for the quote. And it's really a lot of work to find those. So it's one of those things that will save you time in the long run and save you a lot of heartache and headache if you start organizing as you go through. The other thing is then you know if that you've got your sources matched up with your notes and quotes um, from the beginning. So Zotero and Mendeley are both free ones. EndNote has a version that you can buy. We don't buy it as a campus. I actually use Zotero and I've been playing around with Mendeley. Um, I know a lot of people like one or the other. You know, they're free. Play around, see what you like. They both have different features where you can take notes right within it, um, as well as um, keeping track of those citations for you. Okay, so then once you've really, once you've done that first round of collection, you're beginning to read. I just wanted to give you a few hints about reading um, because working with students recently, I found a f some that were getting themselves bogged down because they were trying to do too much in-depth reading at this point and weren't utilizing their skimming skills like they should have been. So remember to use those text features to help you narrow down your choices at the very beginning as you're starting to wade through the collections. Um, you can get a lot of information from the abstract. And if that abstract doesn't seem to really fit with your topic, I'd put it to the side and not even consider it right now. You might go back to it later, but you know, your time is precious. The other thing is when you're reading longer works like dissertations or books, skim them. Use the index, use table of contents for books to figure out which are the relevant sections. For dissertations, scan through them. Look through their lit review. I wouldn't read it in depth. I'd look through it and see which theories they're hitting, which definitions they're using for key terms, what methodology in their methodology section they're using. You can go back and read it more in depth later if it seems to be really useful, but the references and the different theorists, theories that they are pulling from and, and relating to a similar topic that you're doing, those are going to be key at this point as you're developing your conceptual framework. Articles, same thing, skim the abstracts, the introductions and the discussion sections. If it doesn't seem to really fit where you're going, put it to the side. Don't waste your time. Um, and start your organizing early, not just holding your citations, but start organizing your notes. Start, you know, a matrix is a great way to do it because you can break it out in ways that are going to be useful to you. And you can do, you know, with um, Excel and the Google Sheets, you can have a matrix that actually is multiple pages, but each page maybe only looks at two or three key concepts. Or you have a page that's just your methodologies for each of them. So you can break it out and make it work for you. Also keep a list of potential sources based on the things you've been finding and reading. If somebody's article cites a specific author, note that down. You might want to go find that author. 
And one thing that helps me as I'm going through at this stage is to start writing an analytical summary of my items. Just because then I can start remembering what I thought and why I thought it was important and what the key pieces out of those articles were for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but it does help me. And, you know, you may need to find a few organization methods, try out a few before you find something that really works for you. That's normal. And that's another reason to start working on it now is that you have the time now as you're getting everything together. You're not at crunch time. I know it feels overwhelming, but I think in the long run, trying a few things like this will help you as you go. So here's just a couple examples of things that I do. So this is how I use Excel or Google Sheets to make a matrix and I've got my sources, I've got, um, for me concept here mean, meant what was the main idea of the article related to the concepts I was looking at, thesis of the articles, and then a couple of those key concepts. And then if you haven't used Zotero, this is what Zotero and um, Mendeley is pretty similar. It actually compiles a great list of your items. It pulls in all that key information that you need for making your references. You can also attach documents directly to it and take notes. So those are things that are useful, I think, um, at this stage in your academic career. So I'm going to actually finish up the presentation. Um, we can have take time for a few questions if we need to. Contact information, it's always on the um, EDD Library Resources Guide. You can get me by email. You can call and leave a message. Email is better, but if you must call, you, could, I, you can leave voicemail for me. Um, and just remember those resources are there and I'm here to help. So let's go back to the main. All right, do we have any questions? Thank you, Maureen. Clear presentation. I, I, from my own perspective, having worked with candidates, can you describe the importance of the matrix and how you expand that and relate it to the literature review? Yeah. For, but, the matrix, I think, is a very clear visual way to start seeing how your literature connects to each other by your concepts. So when you lay it out by concept, then you can see which of your articles are actually all matching up on a topic. Um, it really makes the synthesis process easier. Headphones slipping again here. Um, because you can see where people agree or disagree and what those major ideas or understandings around each of your core concepts is. So I, it's something that I try to do for all of my writing projects. Mm -hmm. um, and I have some that are humongous, you know, when you're working with, 40, 50, 60, 100 sources, you might end up needing to do multiple matrices, one for each kind of sub concept for your um, conceptual framework or mm -hmm. different pieces. Thank you. And there's some good, um, just for the candidates who are here, there's there are good examples of the matrix in chapter two of your literature review book. Uh, I don't know if this is something you can see, but page four, <laughs> page, page 90 of Maki and McAvoy give you a good way of um, relating both the claims to the attributes that you're searching for, so. Yeah. And I think we also have a couple examples in the SBR course shell, don't we? So. If you'd like to ask questions, you can either unmute yourself or text um, a question in the chat area. Okay. 
All right, I've got a question about handbooks and theories and conceptual framework from chapter two. What are they talking about? It's been a while since I've read that chapter. Um, and I'm not sure where my book is. <laughs> my guess is they're talking about um, something like the SAGE handbook on qualitative research or um, what we would call reference materials, encyclopedias on the topic where you're going to get an overview of the different theorists who dealt with specific topics, um, whether it's the Encyclopedia of Psychology and you're going to look at a variety of psychological theories. That's my guess. Marty, you have the book there. Does it, uh, do you remember what they're talking about? I'm not. Maybe. Um, if oh, Sandra says page 28. Page 28. Thank you. Yeah, they're talking about general handbooks on um, research theory, I think. So the encyclopedias, those kinds of things. Um, um, and they go on to talk about encyclopedias in the following paragraph. Okay. Some of those things are available online, and if we have it, you should be able to pull those up. Um, through the catalog search, and that's one of those things that I'm happy to help you find one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah, they should be available through the library. We do have a couple collections that are um, encyclopedias, handbooks, that kind of thing from Oxford and other publishers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got quite a few of the SAGE handbooks available as e-texts, and they're very good for looking at methodological design, um, so candidates should look at those online. Right. We mm -hmm. also have been um, trying to collect some of them in print, and so if we don't have them online, but you know if you come across a chapter from one of them that seems to be really useful, that's another thing that our interlibrary loan department can do, is they can pull the print copy and photocopy the chapter for you. Mm -hmm because they can't mail you the book, so. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, I I think I want to. Do you generally print everything you use? I tend to save it all first, mm -hmm. and then I print out as I'm reading what I think I'm going to re need. But I do tend to print it out so I can make notes directly on it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a highlighter. Mm -hmm. I use pencil, but I write all over everything. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll throw in my, um, my I, I worked in a, as a research uh, assistant in the library during my um, dissertation phase. So I, I printed everything and I still have the box that's about three feet long with all of my printed materials. I was a print it and go through it that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it has to do with how you, your personal, what works for you. Yeah, if you liked to um, just keep it as a PDF or something and you have an iPad or you use um, some of the Adobe software on a laptop or whatever, um, that can be a really good way to make notes and um, keep track of it. I have done that, but uh, there just there tend to be those times I need that paper and pencil in my hand. <laughs> so we're getting to the top of the hour. I want to thank Maureen for giving us a thorough overview for library um, systems and how they relate to the literature search strategies. And I want to thank Dr. Mary Liz Jones, who initially set up this webinar and then was generous enough to invite uh, all of us to it. And 
Um, we appreciate that very much, Dr. Jones. And we will be working to host another webinar in the next couple of weeks on literature um, argumentation strategies. So how uh, this uh, notion of argumentation plays into the literature review, which is a core principle in Mackey and McAvoy, and a book that you'll have from Ravitch and Riggin and Scholars Before Researchers too. So stay tuned, and we'll uh, get word out to you for that. Thank right. you, everyone. Thank you all for taking time to be here. Thank you.